How's everybody doing today? Cool. I'm doing swell. I got a, a puppy giving birth right now, so praise God. We breed schnauzers and Pomeranians, so it's uh, always an exciting time when we got mamas pumping out babies. But unfortunately, that means this is like Cindy's busy time, so like I had, I don't have to. I get to take my kids everywhere and do a lot of stuff and stand in the gap for my wife, which is great. She's really good at what she does. So she's not here today. We're having puppies. Okay. I was going to say better than babies sometimes, but <laughs> I'm, for the preface, I'm, I want to be done having babies, but so we just switch to puppies and then that'll keep her entertained. We'll be good to go. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for strategy. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pray. So Jesus, we worship you. We love you. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, just be here today. I just feel um, so much joy in my heart. I feel like when I woke up today, I just felt... Um, electric, and I know that that's you, and I thank you that you have the ability to to speak to us and to encounter us in such a way. So God, I ask you to breathe on this word today, and I ask you to um, make it enjoyable and pleasing to us. Um, we just love you. We worship you. There's nobody like you, and I just feel so honored that I get to even just speak to you and uh, just ways, new ways that you show me that I can love you and that I could love other people. Um, there's nobody like you. Amen. I feel like I just go on and on talking about him. He's like the, the big brother. And speaking of big brother, my, uh, my big brother came and visited me this week. So that was this weekend, which was really, really cool. <clears throat> and he was the one that I was uh, talking about that, um, you know, he just came back from the war and he was, acting like a weirdo and stuff like that, and kind of schizophrenia has been, like, disburying itself in its life. And um, for the first time in a long time, we got to, like, really do business about Jesus. And that was a couple months ago on the phone, and I think I, like, shared a little bit with you guys about that. And now um, he came and visited me. He only lives five hours away, so I requested that he visits more than that. Um, but I just got a chance to to love on him, and uh, more importantly, I just got a chance to listen to him, and I like to talk, and I like to, when somebody says something, I like to give advice, and I just, like, overall like to have the answer for somebody, and um, I really felt in my conversations with my brother this week that I could give him a lot of advice, he's searching for a lot of advice, but what he really needs is somebody to listen to him, so... Praise God that um, I listened to the Lord, and we had a we had a very fruitful, very fruitful meeting together. Um, and he just got to say it was just really cool because God said, "Hey, be slow to speak," um, and I was, and it's like so successful because he got so much stuff off of his chest, and um, it was just really cool how different it was when you when you listen to the Lord and He tells you to do something, you do it, and like it's just easy, you know. Praise God for that. And then um we had a lot of fun. Uh we do a lot of golfing on that side of my family and um we didn't really I didn't really want to like pack up the car cuz when I take my brother into like public places, he kind of like he lets anxiety creep in on him and he starts to like think people are looking at him and thinking things about him and stuff like that. So I kind of just uh for now I like to just keep him for myself and do stuff and uh, God gave me a really co cool idea, um, and we made up a game called uh, BYBG, which is uh, Backyard Bucket Golf. Uh, so he always has golf clubs in his trunk, and we just took out, like, the pitching wedges and the, the high irons, and we'd put a 2.5-gallon a bucket out in the field, and then we would basically have my own golf course on my five acres of land, and <laughs> we would just, like, hole ones here and we put the bucket and we just sit there and we try to chip it and everything. And it was really cool. And, um, he made a funny joke that was, um, because of the recession, this is what we've resorted to for golfing is, <laughs> and he's like, is this how Missouri does it? You guys just you just redneck and golf in the backyard. But it was uh, really cool because it created like opportunities for us to talk and listen and, um, just play golf together. Cause that's what we like to do. And, we're both really, I think I'm really good at it, praise God, but it's cool when you just 
are good at something and you don't like can't explain why you are it's just like there's the ball there's where i need to hit it and this is how i'm gonna swing it oh shoot that worked cool and then it works successfully a bunch of times so praise god okay so um again like always um i must touch on worship it was so good and um i just get so much out of worship um during that worship song where it says um, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Like, don't you want to be in that place where my heart is free and my shame is undone? And uh, talking to my brother, you know, there's a lot of things where he's like, oh, I just have to live with this and I have to live with this. And it's like, no, dude, shame is not a part of your life that you have to live with. And then he was asking me, well, how can I get this shame out of my life? And then, like, it's... It's exactly what I was telling him. You got to be in the, in the presence of God. Like, if you feel this way, He can take this away because you weren't made to feel that way. And there's only one way by which it can happen is by being in His presence. So I really liked in the song it says, um, "Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, in Your presence, Lord." So, like, if any of you guys are struggling, we just we just declared it on the song. Like, if you got some shame in your life, get it in His presence has no choice but to be undone and your heart will become free when your heart is free it's like such a good place to be in and um i woke up today and actually a couple times this week and i had this uh like i think it's a jesus culture song going through my heart and it's it's the i am yours you are mine and we will be together forever and it was just like god just kept like just re-hitting me and hitting me and hitting me with it and um, I would just find myself singing it throughout the day because it is it's so true. I am yours. Like he's singing that over you. I am yours and you are mine. And we will be together forever. And just that realization that I get to be that person. I get to be the one that he's saying, I am yours. And not even that. He's saying, you are mine. So it's like there's an exchange there. There's a relationship that's so true. And it just blows me away because I get to have that relationship with him. And what's really cool is you guys get to have and are having that relationship with him. But some people just don't understand that we get to have that relationship with him. And I wish that they would, you know, my my prayer is that people would wake up and instead of thinking about their day or thinking about some trouble coming their way or Uh, thinking about their agenda and what they need to do, if they would just take apart that time and say, God, I'm yours. You're mine. We're going to be together forever. Thank you for walking this day out with me. Thanks for going ahead of me and making sure that the path is clear. God, thanks for protecting my heart today. You know, I mean, like, that's what we need to do. We need to wake up, and the first thing we need to get is Jesus. And then all these other things won't feel like a, such a burden. This burden, what is it? Light. The yoke is easy. Okay, I was making a joke with my kids since it's Sunday fun day. I was like, the longer I preach, the more fun you get to have. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, so what, like you could preach for two hours? And I'm like, well... I don't know. I think you guys were a little mean to me this week. I think I might only go for like 30 minutes, and then and then it was, fun. it was a funny joke I was giving them. But it's Sunday fun day. I love that our church uh, just like really invests in the kids in there, and my kids just absolutely love Sunday fun day. Sunday fun day used to mean something different to me. <laughs> he gets it. <laughs> I remember I used to live in South Carolina, and we'd always party and stuff like that, and you couldn't buy beer on Sunday, so you'd have to go get Saturday beer. And then it was just like I lived in such a way that I would plan out my partying, and I would say Sunday fun day and give the credit to who wouldn't even go to church, wouldn't even think about Jesus, which is not true because I was always thinking about Jesus because he was always pursuing me even in the things that I was doing that I knew were wrong. And I just praise God that he makes such a good twist on Sunday fun day. <laughs> All right, so we're going into the book of James. Um, absolutely love the book of James. Um, and what's really cool is I didn't realize this. Like, I've, I've probably realized this, but I didn't remember. But James is related to Jesus. That's his brother. Like, that's so cool. 
my brother's name is James, so you know, there's a little bit of symbolism. Made in, his, made in his image and everything, you know. All right, book of James. I'm just going to go through James 1. Um, I went through a while where I just read Hebrews every day, and then after I was done with Hebrews, I was like, oh, look, there's the book of James, and that's only five chapters. So I was like, yo, that's easier than 13, and I got a lot out of Hebrews. But if you guys can read James, and if you have time, it's only five chapters long, and it's full of just really, really great stuff on just practical um, ways to live for God and what to do and also how to do it. So here we go. I'm going to start in James 2. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And I know I've talked a little bit about James, and I've touched base on there too. So if you've heard what I'm about to say a little bit, then this is for the people who haven't heard it. <clears throat> so I really like, I'm, I'm just going to break it down right there. So dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. I don't know about you guys, but when trouble comes my way, who has joy as their first response? Yes. <laughs> yes, trouble, it's here. And I was uh I was I was pondering that and um I was thinking, you know, okay, when 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 trials come my way, I'm supposed to be joyful. How can I be joyful about this financial bill coming my way? And um, what's really cool is we're not supposed to be joyful about the trial. We're supposed to be joyful about the opportunity that comes out of that trial. So we get a chance to go through this trial and then rely on God. So when a trial comes your way, it's not, yes, this bad thing, but it's like, oh, I get an opportunity to rely on God, which is what he wants me to do in this circumstance. And that revelation just kind of blew me away a little bit. Okay. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. <laughs> and then every time I uh, read verse 4, so let it grow, I think of uh, let it go, like from Elsa. And then when I, sit, when I read it, I'm like, let it grow, let it grow. So if you're ever going through trials, just remember the let it grow. Um, so let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Um, what I like about that and what that kind of speaks to me, um, is one, I'm supposed to be joyful when a trial comes because that means God it just, I basically view it as like God saying, well, Jesse, this is coming up. Let's go. Like he's tagging me in. He's like, come on, we're in this together. Um, so that would give me great joy. But what's really cool is when you have these in, um, trials, it says like your endurance is tested. And um, your ability to withstand these trials only gets better by um, your endurance, your ability to go through them and rely on God and get built up. Um, and it's kind of like like um, for your, your endurance-wise, like nobody goes and says, you know, tomorrow, hey, I'm going to run a marathon. Like that's like me right now in my state saying, um, I signed up for a marathon. It starts on Tuesday. I really don't think I'm going to be successful at that marathon if I just all of a sudden decide that I want to go run a marathon. Like, it, it takes work. It takes, it takes some getting up in the morning, um, being ready. I don't know what it takes for a marathon. You got to eat healthy. You got to run. You got to get some good shoes. It seems like there's some, some stuff that needs to happen while you're training, while you're building up your endurance for this marathon. And the same way is true um, with God. And we come into trials, um, what do we do, you know? Because um, I know sometimes when I'm going through a trial, I really don't feel like reading my Bible. Um, I really, sometimes when I'm angry or something, I don't really feel like just putting on a worship song. And Jesus, I love, like, dang, there's a lot of stuff going on. Like, my heart is not positioned in this way. Like, I'm, I really just want to stew in my anger right now um, because that's easier. Uh but that's a lie because, you know, it's, it's only easier because your endurance is not built up. Gosh, when this trial comes, I want to be able to be like, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Um, 
So it's like there's a there's a process that happens. So when you're in these trials and you feel like you're failing and you're failing and you're failing, your endurance is growing. Learn from your mistakes. Be in that trial and know you're in that trial and say, God, I'm in this trial and I need your help. And he goes, I know. He's like, I'm here. Just draw on me. Lean on me. Are you are you struggling? Are you sad? Here, let me help you. You know? And then and um and he just gives that promise. So let it grow from when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete and needing nothing. And I like attribute that to when I was younger and I would go through something and it would just be like so traumatic and so powerful. And now that I'm 35, you know, full grown adult old man, right? <laughs> um, I feel like my endurance has grown. Um, and then I like see some other stuff that happens and it just like totally takes me off my feet. Um, but as we go and we endure and endure and endure like there's going to be joy in your trial you're going to be how are you so joyful when this is happening in your life well brother you don't know what i've been through and what he's took me through and what we've been through together it doesn't like you don't get there overnight and sometimes he gives you grace for that trial just immediately he's there all right i think i hammered that one home a little bit all right, and I've, I talked about this one before, but this is one that I that I draw on often, like super often. Um, verse five says, "If you need wisdom, ask who our generous Father, or our generous God, is what mine says, and He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but love the old but in there. But when you ask Him, be sure that your faith is in God alone." Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord for their loyalty is divided between God and the world and they are unstable in everything that they do. Oh my gosh. Like when I read this too, um, and I, I when, I'm, when I'm giving you guys the message, I like repeat it and repeat it, repeat it. But um, you know that's just the way that like I read the Bible too. I'm like, ooh, that was good. Read it again. Ooh, that was good. Read it again. God seal this in my heart. So if you're and I, you know, if you need wisdom, like you need to. This sounds, sounds simple. God, I don't know what to do. God, I don't know where to go. And even if you don't start your phrase with God, I don't know what to do, or God, I don't know where to go. If you just simply are like, I just don't know what to do. I need somebody to help me. Like, ask God, man. He gives it to you, and he won't rebuke you for asking. Um, but when you do ask, obviously, he says, make sure your loyalty is in me alone. Make sure your loyalty is in God alone. And um, what that would look like is, you know, me being like, God, do you think that I should quit my job? And he goes, yeah, I do. I really don't think this is right for you. I really don't think this is healthy for you. Um, and I really have better things for you. And I know it's going to be tough, but go ahead and just do it. Okay, thank you, Lord. Okay, and then I go, hey, Nate, uh, can I talk to you about something? I'm really feeling like maybe I should I should quit my job or something, man, you know, and it's just this and this and that. And what do you think? Oh, I don't know if you should. I say Nate would give this advice, but I'm um, just trying to visually do it for you guys. Nate's just like, oh, I don't know. That's a you got to be really sure about that. That's a really tough decision. What about your family? Who's? I mean, that's a lot of money that you make. How is that gonna? How's that gonna do? Like, why'd you even ask God? You know, if I ask Nate and I don't hear the answer that I want, and then I go to Chad and I don't hear the answer I want, but Bill's gonna give me the answer that I want, and Paul's gonna affirm it. And I know a lot of names. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> let's keep going <laughs> it was funny i have to like um when i first started coming here i had to like go through the directory a bunch and be like this is this person because i like everybody knew my name but like i have a really hard time with everybody else's name back on back on topic um so like if i'm if i ask god this and then i go to nate and then i go to chad and then i just go and i just want to search for what makes me feel better then why the heck did i even ask god in the first place like, if you're going to ask him, do it. If he's going to tell you, do it. You're wasting your time and you're wasting, I don't know if you can waste, you know, God's time. It's kind of just different to say that. But because it is just, because that picture right there is exactly what they're talking about right here. 
I'm going to ask God, and he's going to give me the word, and, and I feel life on it. And I'm like, are you sure that's right? Like, do you know his voice or don't you? Do you spend time with him or don't you? Like, you need to start realizing and recognizing that this is his voice and this is what he's saying, and you need to be confident in what he's saying to you and going after it. Um, you know, and like with youth and even with adults, like we, we get the question a lot, like, how do I know if God's talking to me? You know? And then my thing is, well, do you talk to him? Yeah. You know? Well, what does he sound like? What do you feel like when he's talking to you? Because, you know, when people say, well, how do you know God's talking to you? I know the way he talks to me because I talk to him a lot. I have a relationship with him. If he was on the other side of the door, I would know his voice. Have a relationship with him because when you ask him and he tells you, you want to be able to hear it, you know? You want to be able to grab onto it and say, yes, Lord, this is, I'm confident that this is what you're telling me. You know, and sometimes when you're um, going through life, like, you might get it wrong, you know? Um, you might miss it. But your endurance has had a chance to grow, you know? And then once your endurance is up there, it's easier to hear God's voice. It's easier to hear clear direction. How are you so sure you're going to do this? This is a big deal. Oh, it was a big deal when I asked, but he told me, so we got it. I got the plan. I'm confident. He's, gonna, he's telling me where to go, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to do it because he's good. And everything he does is good. There's no bad in him. Whew. And um, when it says, I love this part too, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. Like I said, perfect, divided loyalties. Um, and then he, and I'm a very visual person, so I love the way he does this. Um, it's unsettled as a wave at the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. And um, I go kayaking a lot, and it's kayaking season now, so I've been, you know, half a dozen times, probably a lot, I've been like a dozen times. I'm just like a, absolutely addicted to it, and I don't know what it is, just being in that water. And um, I think last Sunday I like fell asleep in my kayak because I put in my AirPods, and uh, it was just, there's like barely any water because it's like a ditch like a ditch creek or whatever, you know, it's just a bunch of runoff. Don't exactly want to go swimming in it, but it rained a lot and it was clear. And I put in my headphones and then I just like, I sat back and I was just looking, you know, and I couldn't hear anything but worship music. And I saw birds flying and it was really cool. I saw a turkey run up and stop back up and fly all the way over. And I was just like, God was just showing me these like really cool things. And I was, um, I was thinking about this message and, um, like even me and Lyle were talking about it. We went kayaking, and um, there's these trees there on the banks, and they're like, look like they're coming out or whatever, and their roots are like absolutely exposed. And there's like, there's just these big, like this big around um, roots, and they're just like intertwined, and you can just tell they're just in the dirt, and there's small ones, and there's big ones, and it's like, how the heck is this big tree hanging on right now? There's like, it seems like there's barely any ground there. And, but like God was like, that's what it looks like to be deeply rooted, you know, because this water rushes and this creek gets pretty big. Um, and the water just rushes and it erodes and it tears away the land. And these trees are still standing. And then it's just like, that's what it looks like to be like a wave in the sea. Like you're not planted, you're not rooted. You're just, there's nothing there that's holding you, that's grounding you. So it's kind of like when you ask God for wisdom and he gives it to you, you plant yourself on that word. You, you, you plant yourself in God because I, when the wind comes and it will come and it does come and the water comes and it will come and it does come, I want to not be moved. Like I will not be shaken. I want to like God make my, and like it's cool because the roots are just so just random and intertwined and like they've had relationship because they're a part of that tree and they're burying themselves in there. And that's the way I want to be with God. I want to be so intertwined with him that I am not shaken. I'm not movable. I'm not tossed around. That when I ask him, I know what he's saying. And I won't be moved. And what's really cool is he also showed me another picture where it was like a tree fell down and it was still rooted really good. And then all of a sudden its branches became new trees. So even though there was something that happened in this tree's life where its roots weren't exactly grounded and it fell over. God said, no, no, I still see life in you. Get up. And he brought all new trees out of this fallen tree. 
that still is rooted. You know what I mean? It's just such a great picture. It's just, it's just good. Like God, and that's nature. Like he made that and he can speak to you like that. And, you know, he, he shows you things in life. You just got to be able to listen. And like, you know, praise God, I get an opportunity to, you know, go fall asleep in my kayak on a Sunday. So it's completely safe. It's like probably waist high water. And, um, I ended up, um, what was really cool is I was going, I knew I was coming up to something and I was going backwards down the creek or whatever. And I was just like, I just don't want to open my eyes, so I'm not going to. I mean, it's nothing that's really too bad. And then all of a sudden I hit this little, this little stump that was there and then it like corrected me. And then next thing you know, I open my eyes and I'm completely straight. And I'm like, that's the way God works too. I'm coming down the creek and I'm going backwards in life. And there's just this little stump that's sticking out. And I hit it, and now I'm corrected. And now I'm, I have more confidence because I can see what's ahead of me. I don't have to, like, go backwards or anything like that. So it's cool that sometimes you can go backwards, and then God just, just gives you a little bump. That's all you need. And then you let the current take you, and then you're on the right path. Kind of like re- repentance, really, when he's like, hey, you should, should you be doing that? No, I shouldn't. You're right. And then you're on the right path. That's all it takes. Forgiving you, he's there. All right. We're going to go to verse 9 now. Um, Believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade like a flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls, and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. And then on here I wrote, poor, grateful, rich, humble. And I was going to go into a a big thing on um, 9 through 11, but I think I will kind of move on a little bit, but um, has anyone in here ever lived poor? Yeah? Oh, yeah. We know what we're talking about then. <laughs> I think all of us at some point have lived in in that area of um, saltine crackers and cheese and ramen noodles and frozen pizza and chili dogs, which happens to be my absolute lineup when I have to cook food. So... I don't know if I'm still living poor or what. I mean, like, if what's good is good. It was good when I was poor. It's good now. So <laughs> my wife absolutely hates it when it's when she leaves and it's my turn to make supper because she's like, how was supper? It was great. We had chili dogs and, and chips. She's like, I had I made rice for you, like, earlier. All you had to do was heat it up. And I'm like, Ugh. I hate rice, by the way. It's just one of those things that I just get grossed out eating. It's just not good. I like sticky rice, though. That's really good. Um, but, like, um, it got me to realize, I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit, I guess. Like, when um, when you're living in a poor lifestyle, in a, in a poverty, you know, you're not getting this much money. And, you know, I I lived in a poor lifestyle well, because it was my own decision, really, um, because I was spending my money on other things and just being irresponsible. Um but growing up, we didn't have, like, a, a ton of money, and um, as an understatement, like, my mom and dad would save their money and allocate it, and, you know, we'd still get to do some fun stuff, but, um, like, when it came time for me to buy my own bike, my dad said, you're buying your own bike, I don't care if all your kids, you know, it's like, it was that summer when everybody got a bike, and everybody was meeting up, and there's a new skate park and everything, and my dad was just like, I'm not buying you a bike because we don't have the money. Go get it. Go go make some money. Because um, then if I buy you a bike, you're not going to respect it. You're just going to trash it up and, you know, just pop your t- You know, whatever. I was, he just knew how I was going to be or how people are in that step. So he made me go make my money. He made me go work with my Uncle Tim and his plumbing business, and it was horrible. There was flies, and it smelled like poop, and... All I did was hold a flashlight and get yelled at and not know what a what the heck he was talking about and like what soldering iron I don't even know torch whatever all I know is he gave me a sucker I took out that sucker and I put it back in my mouth and there was a fly on it so yeah and I thought it was just like a piece of sandwich that I was eating for lunch earlier so I was like that's a fly and I'll never forget it to this day I'm 35 years old and that still just haunts me like my kids are having a sucker and I'm like you 
Okay. Okay. We're good. No flies. But that was a trial that I had to go through. <laughs> um but it was it was it was cool um i helped him out and uh he overpaid me like big time uh, he, he was just like uh here you're trying to buy a bike uh, how much is your bike and i said well mongoose at uh walmart's like 80 bucks which they're still 80 bucks but uh there's like 80 bucks and he goes all right here's 100 and i was like oh my god i've never seen 100 bucks in my whole entire life i was like this is so cool my uncle's so rich i'm gonna go work for him i can make I can make $500 a week if I work every day. <laughs> and if I don't want to, I'll work two days a week, and that's still more money than I've ever had. Um, but it was cool because they gave me this 100 bucks, and I came up to my dad, and I was like, really like, got it. One day's worth of work. Got the money. Here you go. Let's go to Walmart and buy a bike. And he was like, no, I'm not going to let you do that, Jesse. Excuse me? <laughs> like, you just told me, and he's like, yeah, I know what I told you. It was such a good lesson for me, though. Um, he was like, do you know the uh, the quality of a Walmart bike is not going to be anywhere close to the quality if we go to, like, I think it was, like, Mike's Bike Shop in Mitchell. It was, like, an hour away. And they had, like, Schwinn's and Huffies, and, you know, they had all the good bikes with the good wheels and the good chrome. And um, I watched my kids get, not my kids, I watched my friends get, like mongooses and stuff like that and they would just he was right they this is a super lesser quality um and he knew that i would just just beat it up and then in a year i'd be in the same spot and then i just have and then he'd have a bike to throw away or you know something like that so he said no how about you really work hard and i'll save this money and i will help you like i'll give you a ride to where you need to go and get the things you need to get um but just trust me i want you to buy a better bike so I had to go through and I had to work harder. And this time, my dang uncle didn't give me $100 to go freaking work for him. He just gave me like 10 or 20 after that. And I was like, because he realized he overpaid and then he'd, I'd be coming back for more working. And so long story short, I saved up like 350 bucks, and um, I went and I bought a bike. We went there and it was a great day. We took all of my friends with me and um, they helped me like celebrate with me picking on a bike it was just like a really great time and then for all that week i was just on cloud nine riding my bike and i had a really good bike i had a schwinn like powermatic and it was like in my opinion the best bike in all of here on south dakota for a 10 to 13 year old kid to have and dang it everybody knew that i had a really great bike and wouldn't you know it a week later i went out to ride my bike it was gone Somebody freaking stole my bike. And then I couldn't believe it because I didn't think anybody would steal something from me that I worked so hard to get. And um, I found out who it was, made a police report and everything. I found out who it was, and it was somebody that was my friend that wasn't my friend and all this kind of stuff. And um, what he did is he just joy rode the bike for the night and then threw it in the lake. Because he, did, he didn't want to get caught with it. Because it was the only bike in town like that. It was nice. I said it was a Schwinn, baby. <laughs> um, but I had a choice to make. Um, and I knew it was him. And um, I was, you know, my dad always told me that if I got in a fight, that he'd pull me out of wrestling and stuff like that. And wrestling was a really big deal for me. And I had to, like, I had a decision to make. And I made the right one. I didn't confront him about it. I didn't say, hey, I knew it was you. Hey, I knew you did this. And um, really just because I wanted to like avoid some trouble and stuff like that. But uh, when I was a senior in high school, uh, he did me wrong. We were working at a restaurant, and he did me wrong. And I backed him against the wall, and I said, I know it's you who stole my bike. And then he thought I was going to like really tear into him and mess him up and stuff like that. And I was like, that was really crappy of you to do. And then I walked away. But um, all of that, um, on a rich and a poor standard, um, you know, some kids nowadays, they're like, Dad, I want a bike. Sure, which bike? I want this bike. And they go and they get them that bike, okay? What did they have to endure during that whole process? Thanks, Dad, you gave me a bike. I mean, that's cool. If you can provide that for your kids, cool. But also give them a lesson in that, too. Like say you know, hey, I bought you this bike, but let's put together a plan how you're gonna how you're gonna earn this bike. 
And um, I had to go through certain trials, uh, fly in the mouth, smelling, smelling some stuff, you know, and I had to, um, to go through it. And um, out of it became a good lesson Till even though I'm 35 and I still remember my Schwinn Powermatic bike, I had a choice to make way back then. And I still forgive that kid. And I know his name still. His name is Thomas. <laughs> and I bless him. Hopefully his kids have all the bikes they'll ever. Maybe I should just do that. Maybe I should like search him up and then go buy his kid a, a Schwinn or something like that and send it and be like, been thinking about you for about 20 years, brother. I love you. Thanks for this opportunity. Um, but there's just like, there's just different things, you know, like um, if if somebody's poor and they get a little bit, they're so grateful for it, you know. Like um, me growing up, a pizza night when my dad would come home with two tombstone pizzas and a, a blockbuster video VHS, I knew it was awesome. Like I knew it was it was game time, baby. We're having fun tonight. Um, but you know, in a different household, so what? They brought pizza. Yeah, I, would, I was kind of just watch the movie in my room. Like there's just a a difference about it. And then like you know, when a, a wealthier person gets something. And they're used to getting something. I feel like they're kind of just like, thanks, man. Yeah, like doesn't mean a lot to them, you know. But um, there's something to be said on on what's your, no matter your financial situation. Like, what is your what is your headspace when something happens? When something gets given to you, are you grateful? Are you humbled? Are you like, where, where's your heart at on it? I'm sorry if that didn't make sense for nine to eleven. That's probably why I was going to skip it. Okay, let's go to 12. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And does anybody else know where the crown of life got brought up in the Bible? A different place. In Revelations 2, 10. And it's called, um, it's also associated to like the martyr crown. Let me just go there and read it. Bible. Revelations 2.10. It says, don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you in prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. I think it's really cool how um, in James that it kind of s- premises the same thing. You know, if you endure this uh, this trial, this temptation. I love how it says patiently, though. If you patiently endure the testing and the temptation. So if you're not patient, you don't get it. <laughs> God built patience in my heart. Afterwards, they will see the crown of life, and it's like um, I always said growing up, like dying a martyr is the best thing you can ever do because your reward is just exponentially better. <laughs> so if somebody was like, are you a Christian? Yeah. <laughs> like at the top of my voice, I'm a Christian. Like you just made everything so much better for me to be like persecuted in this way. And remember when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. And this is something that I was going through with my brother. And, you know, he was just like, oh, you know, uh, maybe God's God's just tempting me. I'm just like, no, dude, he's not. Remember, when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Ugh. So remember, guys, when you're being tempted, I love it. Don't say it. Because, you know, how many people do we run into and you know, God's just tempting me? Or people think that God brought these things on your life. Um, and I like... What they're getting at, too, is um, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. So our sin comes from a desire that we have placed in our heart to fulfill. 
It comes on our flesh. It doesn't come from our spirit because God didn't give us that. It comes from our flesh. And it's really funny that the devil knows what we fleshly desire. (laughs) And he will tempt you with it. And we have to not give in. It says it right there. Because God's not tempting you. So if you're ever being tempted by something, if, if you could see... If you had to pay f- the price for your sin immediately, it wouldn't be so tempting. You know what I mean? Because sin <laughs> gives birth to death. So if you had to pay that price immediately, well, I don't think that sin would ever like really be that big of an issue. But what's really cool is he's paid that price. So we don't have to pay that price. What I like, too, it it says here that it just shouts to me, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. So it seems like when you give in to your sin, um, you're you're allowing yourself to be drug away from God. So it's kind of like even if we are living in sin, I don't think we're just, you know, hopping hopping and going. I think it's still like we still want to be here and... Uh, and it's just dragging us away because it's. I think it's also like a struggle. Like if you choose to sin, you know what's going on. Just like my brother, he's um he's he's getting sober from alcohol, and we were having conversations where he was just like this anxiety just creeps in, and then I get in the car and I'm mad, and I I drive to the liquor store, and and before I can get out of the car, I'm so sick to my stomach that I can't even think straight, and I'm like. Praise God. Because brother, I've been there. <laughs> and that's like that's that's God saying, You don't need this in your life. Cause and, and if and if he makes the choice to get out of that vehicle and buy those booze and go home and drink it, the whole while he's he's getting convicted. And in order to go through this is what a clear picture of what it looks like to be drug away with our sin. Because God's asking you not to do it. You know you shouldn't do it, and yet you're still doing it. It's like, but you know you want to be here, and your spirit wants to be here, and you're forcing yourself to go here. So it's kind of just like a really good picture of what it looks like to be drug away. All right. So when that temptation comes, we need to, we need to have the ability to say no and how will we have that ability if our endurance hasn't been built up and tested? So it's just kind of bringing it like full circle there. He's telling you, build up your endurance for these trials. Because when these trials come, you'll want to sin, and you need not to. And the only way not to is to recognize that you want to sin and how not to sin. And it sounds like it takes some work. <laughs> it takes some building. It takes some learning. It takes some experience. So if you're if you're going through it and you failed, get back up and go again. It, it's how you build the endurance. This trial took me last time. I'm not letting it take me again, and and learn from it. Like um, with my, my with my brother and alcohol. Like I was telling him, you need to you need to change your lifestyle, man. It's not just a matter of I'm not going to drink again, but it's like it's a matter of recognizing, hey, this triggers me. I need to do something different. And that's how you get to realize and build endurance. Oh, here it is. I know what to do. That's not a problem anymore. So it's just really cool. How it's just like a work. Like God's relationship with you is a is a working progress. It's a because he he could make you just complete and lacking nothing. And then it's just like he wants you to. He want, it's almost like he wants you to walk through this with him and have him realize that he's there helping you every step of the way. It's as if. All right. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heaven. He never changes or casts shifting shadows. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Come on now. So don't be misled. So like, read your Bible, guys. Have conversation with Jesus. Like that's like to not be misled is to know His voice and to know what's going on. 
And how are we going to know if we don't speak to him? How are we not going to know if we don't hear his voice? How are we going to know if we don't have a relationship with him? How are we going to know if we don't read this Bible? How are we going to know if, like, just be in his presence? It seems like that's what changes everything. So, so I just pray, like, guys, don't be misled. Jesse, how do we not be misled? Be led by the Spirit. What is he teaching you? What is he telling you? Where are you growing? How are you growing? Like there's so many of these things that need to have conversations with God about ourselves. Like you could focus on yourself for a very, very long time and still know that there's more stuff going on. And um, in your private time, that focusing on yourself um, isn't such a bad thing because sometimes that's what God wants you to just you and him and that's it. And if you can work on yourself, then you can be there for other people. You can be available for other people, and you can know what to do because all your junk has been put aside. So when you go out into the world, your junk needs to be gone so that you can be inept to, to focus on these people, to hear God's word with nothing, no distraction getting in your way. What did I say last week? Remember what I did? Da, 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 da. Almost flipped that guy off on the freeway. Praise God I didn't driving and anger all right let's go to um yeah i can't skip over this part he chose 18 i just love it i love the wording here he chose to give birth to us thank you jesus for choosing us like he chose us and then i love um it just like obviously just makes my heart just swell and we out of all creation, became his prized possession. And when I was sitting in the kayak and I was feeling the breeze and it kind of, it, just, it was just perfect. The grass was going green. The flowers were growing. And I'm just like, out of all of this beauty, I'm your prized possession. And we need to realize that too because sometimes we think of ourselves as less. And this isn't like a, you know, a get up and <coughs> only focus on yourself type of message. But um Sometimes there's some self-love in there that we need, that God, that we just skip over, that um, it's not important, it's just my feelings. The God, that's everything. Like, you are important. Your feelings are valid. Stop going to other people to validate your feelings. You know, it's good to have those brothers and sisters that that sharpen your iron, um, but ultimately, like, go to God first and do what he says. Does he say, "Go go and talk to Nate about this issue? Go ahead. Does he call you to call on your brothers from for some advice? Then then do it. Or is he saying, listen to me. This might be hard and people won't understand it. But go for it. All right. Almost done. I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, last part, 19 um, through 26. It says, I love this part. It's called listening and doing. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all... <laughs> You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Who here is great at all three of those? Sweet. (laughs) I'm I'm, I'm on the same. We're in the same boat, guys. I have a, like, oh, that was so cool, too. Yeah, and, like, even with my brother, he said, just listen to him. You know, just be quick to listen. I have such a hard time with that. And um, I think the youth kids will even tell you, like, I'm, I'm quick to quick to say something when they have, you know, they have something that we're talking about in the Bible, and I'm, because I just like, I like answering those questions, but I should be quicker to listen than I am to speaking, you know, and I'm learning that as I'm gr- I'm going, you know, it's really tough when somebody says, oh, you kind of just, you know, it feels like you take control of the room or something, you know, like when you feel that and you hear that, you're like, oh, okay, thank you, because <laughs> I, I never would have known if nobody would have said something. Um, but the Bible said something, right? Um, slow to speak. I feel like God's just speaking to me here. <laughs> and slow to get angry. Um, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So in 19, um, I have a little side note. It says, sounds like more endurance needs to be built. Um, must be all quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. It feels like you only get to that point when your endurance is growing in that atmosphere because you're not all of a sudden just going to be awesome at quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry unless you've 
had that opportunity to test it. You know what I mean? To test that, okay, today I did good on being slow to speak. Today I was really good at quick to listen. But dang it, my anger got a hold of me. And it seems like there's a situation where all three of these can happen at one time. Okay, verse 20, it says, Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Um, and I, I put in there, he's not looking for angry people. He doesn't desire angry people. So, and this is like something that I ward off in my life, but like bitterness. Like um, there's, there's situations in my life where I could just be angry about it and how could they and, you know, like this is just, this is just crap that this could be happening. Um, but that's not what God desires out of me. He doesn't desire that. Um, so if you're dealing a lot with anger, there's just that bitterness that can be creeping up in you, and it'll choke you out 100%. So if you have some bitterness or anger in your life, you really need to just get with God and say, God, why am I bitter? Why am I angry? Help take this from me. Relieve this burden from me. Lift it because um, I can't operate uh, the way you desire me to operate if I'm in, in this anger and in this frustration. And then we go to uh, verse 21. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save souls. So like I was saying, like, I can't operate, um, like, when I go and, and, like, do evangelism or reaching out to people. If I'm not quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry, um, I, I just really don't feel like I'm going to be successful and if you're going through a trial in your life and you're, and you're really wondering how you can get through this trial and one way that you can have your endurance built, um, verse 21 says it all. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and just humbly accept the word God has planted in your heart for it has the power to save souls. So if you have some stuff that you're going through, like for instance with my brother, it's alcohol. Get rid of the filth, bro. Like, what is in your life that's holding you up? What's filthy and what's angry in your life? That, and you guys, you know, if you think about your life, you know what I'm talking about. There's just certain things, or even in your life as you've lived, there's stuff that you've had to just humbly be like, that's not for me anymore. You know, just like um, with drugs and my old friends, I just had to just simply say, I love you guys. It's just it's not for me anymore. It's just not. I, and I, I couldn't be effective in, in saving souls um, when I was still operating with this evil and filth in my life. Because what does it do? It gives birth to death. Okay. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you are only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself and walk away and forget what you look like. But... If you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. That's so super good. So what that, like, correlates out to, too, like if you wake up in the morning and make sure I'm on the right. Yep. So if you wake up in the morning, and um, and you guys can try this later, um, but you wake up in the morning or even not, you go to the bathroom and there's a mirror there, and you go, I'm going to spend three seconds looking at myself in the mirror. Just boom, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three, boom. And you go out, and then you go and you think about it, and you're like, um, we know what hairs are out of place, like um, that I brush my teeth or my like my I got bags on my eyes. I don't know what people do when they look in the mirror. I don't really look in the mirror that often. Um, but now if you go back to that mirror and you say, I'm going to spend a solid minute looking at myself in the mirror. Okay, in that three seconds, you started to know what hair was out of place or whatever, and you, you really just didn't get a good example of like what's what's good to go. You know, if I'm going to an important meeting, I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to spend three seconds around the mirror and go. Um, but uh, if you've ever spent like two solid minutes just staring at yourself in the mirror, there's some, some stuff that's going to be going on in your head. You know, like, my eyebrows really that thick? Holy smokes, I got a big head. Like, from here to here is kind of just like, whoa. Um, 
Jeez, my ears that do they does everybody see them that way or no? <laughs> but you um and I guess I'm just thinking on the critical level, but um you see more, you know what I mean? You you get to uh really see yourself as a person and these are what my eyes look like, okay. And then, you know, and you start to know yourself and you start to, you know, have this kind of like inward conversation about your hair looks good, man. Your 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 beard's looking good. There's, there's gray in there. I I really want my beard to be all gray and my hair to be all gray. I can't wait until that happens. Uh just a weird thing I've always wanted since I was a kid. My grandpa was gray at a young age and I'm like, I can't wait. I'm just gonna embrace it. Um but the same <laughs> the same thing is true. Um, this visual analogy is the same way that it can be like with our Bible. Um, do we just glance at it? You know, I did. I did. Okay. Yep. I read that chapter like I wanted to. Uh, everything's good. Or do we really just look at it? Do we really just dive into it and read it again and again? Just like I'm saying, like when I go over, when I go over five through uh, five through eight, like, do we just read it? Do we meditate on it? Do we take it for ourselves? Or do we just glance at it in the mirror? Because if I just glance at this Bible and I go and I, I go about my day and everything, I'm not fulfilled. You know, I, I need that, that full communion with God. I need, to, I need to dig in. I need to spend more than just a glance because that's, you know, God's worth more than that. You're worth more than that than just a glance at your Bible. Um, just a thank you, Jesus, for this day. Amen. That's really cool. But Jesus, I'm yours. You're mine. I love you. I'm just here to speak with you. I'm just here to have conversation with you. I'm here to just look at your face. Because I know when I look at your face, I ravish your heart. But I want more than just a glance. I just want to be with you. God, speak to me through your word. And then when I'm reading it, you know, it's, it means something because you're, you're focused in. You're, you're intentful. You're not just glancing at it because... I feel like it, it means more to like means more to God. I don't know how to explain it really, but it's like you have you have more in there. You're putting more of yourself into there. You're more of your time, more of your thought, more of your energy, and it actually becomes a lifestyle in a way that you live. I live in this Bible. I do what it says. God, I thank you that I'm quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry. All right, now I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna finish it up right here. Um, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure, genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for the orphans and widows. For some reason, I like saw it as windows. I was like, don't say that out loud, but now I did. So how about that? Uh, <laughs> Father means caring for the orphans and windows. All right. Uh, Father, <laughs> God the Father means caring for the orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. And um, what was really cool is Cindy went to this uh, AKC dog breeding show and she made this friend um, and it was an elderly lady and um, she really just got to know her and she was like, hey, I'm going to take all this food in my fri our fridge and I'm just going to give it to her. And I was just like, I was like, that sucks, because, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, because it's, like, I know, like, financially where we're at, and she went shopping, and she, and, like, I was just like, oh, babe, that's so cool, but I think you're a little zealous, like, that's cool, don't even know this lady, and uh, my wife was really cool, because it's kind of just like a, like a chop to me, because she was like, orphans and widows, Jesse, she's a widow, <laughs> and I'm just like, uh, okay. Um, but it was just so, and, you know, and I was, I was, uh, it wasn't even my idea to do it. And I was against it initially, you know, what do you mean you're going to take all over? <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't like clean out the cupboards or nothing, but she was taking some stuff that I had planned to make and eat and had planned on, you know, and my, I'm like limited on what I, uh, skill level. I won't speak that I'm not limited. I'm, um, God's going to be expanding my cooking, uh, range and I am an, <laughs> yeah. Hey, I put, all right, so I, I get the bread, and I put the chili down first, and then I put the hot dog on top, and then it goes to the cheese. It's just, it's gourmet. It's not just slap it on there, okay? Uh, but I wasn't on board with it when she initially said it, because I was just like, oh, she's got family, doesn't she? Oh, there's, like, food pantries, isn't there? You know, like, there's, there's, there's ways we can help her out. And I was just like, dang. 
James 1, it's true religion, feeding the orphans and widows. Without a second thought, my wife was like, it's yours. You can have it. What did God do? Filled up our cupboards. Like, absolutely crazy. It was really cool. My wife got up at, like, 5 in the morning and went to, like, a Kingsville uh, food pantry or something like that. If you guys are ever needing food, um, don't be afraid to go to a food pantry or whatever because that's what they're there for. Um, And if you have a problem with going to a food pantry, maybe you should have a conversation with yourself. Maybe your pride's just way too high. My mom, or my mom, my Cindy, my Cindy, Cindy asked me, hey, I don't have time. Can you stop by the food pantry? And I was like, <laughs> what? You want? Oh, you're breaking up, babe. I can't hear you. Can't hear you. And the God was just like, you're going to deny a blessing that I've given you? Like, yeah, you got, yeah, you got some money in your account. Yeah, you got food in your fridge, but I've provided a way for you. You're not going to take it? The blessing. Like, you just emptied out your cupboards. You let me fill them back up. And it was really cool because if I would have let pride get in the way, I never would have went in that line and stood there and talked to the nice lady. You know what I mean? So it was just really cool that my wife is, I get to brag on my wife, basically. It's really cool Um, because she's doing it, you know, and she had that heart for it, and she recognized it, and she went for it. I would necessarily wouldn't have made that decision right away. Okay, and then I also had, um, I heard a guy say something that I wanted to mention today. Um, He said that if you stood trial for your faith, um, for being a Christian, if they came in that door today and they put you in handcuffs and they took you in, would you be found guilty of being a lover of God? You know, what'd you do last week? Where were you? Where were you? Who'd you talk to and what'd you say? I'll tell you, because <laughs> we're looking for Christians, and we're looking for people who love God, and we want to get them out of here, and we're going to put you on trial, and if you're found guilty, you're going to death. <laughs> and it was just like, how many people in America, if they were put on trial for their faith, would be found guilty? I want to be one of those that are found guilty. Yeah. Love Jesus. I want to see today, I was talking to Nate, um... And I pulled up at this gas station, and I got an opportunity to bless somebody, but I wouldn't have had the opportunity to bless somebody if I didn't hear God's voice. She was sitting out there, and um, I saw, like, some dollar bills in her hand, and her foot was up on her door, and her head was down or whatever, and um, God was just like, hey, pay attention. He was like, what am I saying? And then I was like, okay. And then I I heard change rattling around or whatever, and she would, I realized she was down because she was, like, digging for change in her car. And then God was like, you remember what it's like? I like, guess I do. And he was like, check your wallet. You got cash? Yes, I do. He was like, you know what to do. So it was cool. I just went in there. I went in ahead of her, and I was just like, hey, pump three, red truck, $10. Act like nothing happened. And he was like, okay. So she came in there, and she was like, you know, $4 and 30-something cents, and then went out to pump her gas, and then by the time I got out there, the gas was still going, and she was like, did you pay for my gas? And I was just like, maybe. <laughs> like, maybe maybe I did. And she was like, thanks so much. And um, she just got emotional, you know. And um, I don't say that to, like, at all bring any attention to me, but, like, I got an opportunity to do that, you know. I got to have my spirit eyes, and I got to see that. All that thing, everything that happened, everything I just explained is exactly the way it can happen for you guys. You just have to be paying attention to what God's telling you. You have to think about somebody else more than you think about yourself. Think about somebody else more than church is starting at this time and I got to be there. No, you got to love that person. And it was cool because that meant everything to this lady, you know. And I was just simply just like, you know, you're God's favorite person today. And it's your turn to receive that blessing. And she was just like, you know, I just could tell the body language. She was trying to hold it together. And then I get in the car, and my kids are like. They ask, cool. Peyton's like, did you pay for her gas or something? And I'm like, yep. And they all just know. And they all celebrate because it's what we do. 
we get an opportunity to be those people to people. When people are dying and hurting every day and we don't know what they're going through. So, this week, don't just take my word for it, okay? Dig into James. See what he's telling you. Go into there and be, God, am I slow to speak? God, do I have joy when these trials come? Do I have joy in you when a hard time comes? If you're going through a hard time, just really just See the state of your heart and where you're at because the sooner you can realize where you're at, the better it'll be for you. The better it'll be in these trials. The better it'll be to help you overcome these kind of things. I think my kids will be happy with me. 11.42 for Sunday fun day. And I could go on forever and ever, and I just, I just, um, you know, I get so nervous when I, I'm putting together a message and everything, and um, I just realize, you know, if you love Jesus, you can talk about him, you know, and um, you guys have all these people that you encounter that I don't, and that, you know, Jim doesn't, and Bill doesn't, I mean, there's just all these people that your oikos, your sphere of influence, just be that person for them, you know, if you see somebody going through a trial and a really hard time, come up alongside of them and say, brother, I'm here for you. If you talk to God, you know, just give them, you know, in James, it says that when you have a trial, um, it's an opportunity for joy to come out of it. Do you feel joyful? No, I don't feel joyful. How can I help you? You know, maybe you're that person that helps them get through that trial. All right, I'm going to pray. If you guys need prayer for anything, uh, it's really weird not seeing like Rod and Glenna here. Rod, Glenna, we miss you. Jesus, we worship you. We love you. If you guys need any prayer for anything, come up. Um, we're going to be just doing some worship um, and really dig into James and say, God, help me when a trial comes to lean on you and not on what I, how I think this should go. Jesus, we worship you. We love you. We thank you for creating us. We thank you for giving birth to us, Jesus. We thank you that we are your prized possession. May we not lose sight of of who we are. <laughs> I am Jesse, and I am a prized possession of the Lord. I am Jesse, and Jesus died for me. Jesus, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for speaking to us continually. Even if we're not ready to listen, you're still so patient with us and loving. I thank you that you're not a big man upstairs who's just mad at us. I thank you that when you see us, you are pleased. God, let us break pride right now in Jesus' name. That may we not be too proud to come to you when we're in, when we're feeling like we're in trouble. Jesus, thank you for tearing that down and ripping it out of our life. God, I ask you to speak to areas in our life where we are sinning, God or we have sinned, that we may turn our face to you and just simply say, I'm sorry. And we know that that's enough, that we don't have to sit down and beg you, that you've forgiven us, God, and that you know that we're bigger than the way that we're acting. And I thank you, God, that you're going to help us and love us and walk through this with us. And it won't, I feel like it won't be like a path of like gravel rocks, but it'll be just soft grass and daisies. Thank you for being who you are, Jesus.